I want you to think about things that you treasure in your life. Do you have more treasures or more regrets? Can you look back in your life and think about how God's worked in your life, the good things that have happened to you, places you've been, all the things that, that are so good in our lives? What stands out at the very tip top? Four decades ago, we started In Touch Ministries to lead people worldwide into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Throughout the years, we've seen God's greatness, His love and His blessings in such awesome ways that we just want everyone to know Him. So let's open God's Word and seek Him together. Today on In Touch, Treasures of the Heart. When you think about treasure, what comes to your mind? Well, most people would say, well, money, prosperity, riches, all of those things come to mind. Well, if the only thing that comes to your mind when you think about riches is material things, you must be very poor because the best things in life are not material. Best things in life supersede the material. Best things in life are higher quality than all of that. But on the other hand, there are some material things that are good. 
And God is a good God, and He gives us what we need, and much more than we deserve, much more oftentimes than we expect or anticipate. Treasures. Treasures. What is it in your life that you treasure? Is it somebody? Is it something? Some experience in your life? What is it that you treasure? And in this message, I want you to think about that. What is it in my life that I really and truly treasure? That is, I hold it dear. I hold it close. I protect it. It has high value to me. I love it. What is it that you really and truly treasure in life? Well, of all the people who had many things to treasure, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is certainly one of them. And it's interesting in the Scripture that two times, twice, she mentions the fact of treasuring what she's heard, what she's seen, what she's experienced, treasured in her heart, quietly holding it there, pondering it, thinking about it, examining it, and enjoying it. So I want you to turn, if you will, to the second chapter of Luke. And I want us just to read a couple of verses or so here, so to set the uh, stage. And remember that uh, Jesus at this point has been, has been born. And um, the angels have um, announced to the shepherds about what's happened. And the Scripture says in verse 15 of this second chapter, When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry, and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. And then, again, the Scripture says a little later on, and we'll come to this, the Scripture says, in verse 51 of Luke, same chapter, And he went down from with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So I would ask you again, what is it that you treasure, you hold dear to you, that you do not want to let go, that you like to think about it, that you ponder it in your heart? And I want us to look at the scripture here and ask that same question and to think about it from the perspective of what Mary held in her heart and what she treasured in these experiences. So what's the first thing you think she treasured? Here's what she treasured. One day she was just doing what little girls in those days did by helping their mother in the kitchen and so forth and or playing with their friends at that age and suddenly the angel of God, Gabriel, comes to her. Now, whether she sees him or not, it's not the issue. The issue is that he made it so crystal clear. And he said something to her that did not even make sense at first. But here's what he said to her. He said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. She never forgot that. She never forgot that sound. It was the sound of heaven. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. The Scripture says she was perplexed at this statement, kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. Listen, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And he'll be great, and he explains all about that. And then she says, how can this be since I am a virgin? Never, never had a relationship with a man. How can this be? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So imagine this. Here she is, a teenage girl, just going about her life, just like normal teenage girls would in those days, young teenage girls. And she gets this message from God, you're going to have a baby. 
how could that possibly be? And then he explains it. She never forgot any of that. She treasured those moments in her heart, probably because she was afraid. As he, the Scripture says, she was perplexed. She didn't understand all of that. But she did understand this. He said, favored one. And he said, the, the, the Lord will be with you. Now, one of the things that she had to face as a result of that was this. She knew the law of Moses, and that was, if a woman was caught in the act of adultery, and certainly she would have been accused of that, having a baby and not having a husband, you stone her to death. Imagine what the father and mother thought. Absolutely impossible. She's lying to us. How could you do this to us? Because they were shamed. Uh, the man she was going to marry, Joseph, would be shamed uh, in a small village. Everybody would know it very shortly, and they'd be looked down upon. And besides that, there's the threat of being stoned to death. So, what do you think she remembered? What, what is it she treasured in her heart doing all these things? These were terrifying sort of thoughts, even though she knew that God had said it. And so, she, she said to the angel, you know, be it unto me even as you have spoken. And so she surrendered to that. But remember, she's still a teenager. And secondly, this is her family. And she's about to embarrass her whole family, all of her friends, all of her playmates. Everybody's going to shun her because she's destined for death. Now, here's one thing she never forgot. When she had to tell Joseph, he probably felt the same thing. You have betrayed me. You have been unfaithful. You have been disloyal. You have broken our marriage vow because engagement was just legal. And finally, at some point, here's what he said, and she could never forget it. She couldn't forget his voice, nor the expression on his face when he said, Mary, I believe you, and I love you. And I'm still going to marry you. She can never forget that. Treasure that forever. And while we're thinking about this, I want you to think about things that you treasure in your life. Do you have more treasures or more regrets? Can you look back in your life and think about how God's worked in your life, the good things that have happened to you, places you've been, all the things that, that are so good in our lives? What stands out at the very tip top? What, it, what is it that you treasure? What is it that you hold very, very dear in your life? And I'm going to ask you that several times because I want you to think about it. Scripture says that she treasured all of these things in her heart. Now, so what happens? He accepts her as his wife, and doing so, that protects her from uh, being stoned to death. He assumes full responsibility. And then Caesar Augustus passes his rule that everybody must go to their hometown where they were born and register. And so uh, they have to go to Bethlehem. That's over 100 miles. Now, that's not on the highway, but, and also it was riding a donkey, side saddle. A hundred and some miles on a donkey. Now he's walking, she's riding, but she's pregnant. We're in them hotels and hotels. What about food? Uh, what about the place to stay? And what about all the dangers of those days? And so here they are, and people are coming and going, going to their hometown, and, and she's on her way to Bethlehem. So when they get there, trying to find a place, imagine what Joseph must have been thinking. I better hurry, because I hear, I hear what's going on. And so he's trying to find a place, and finally he does. And the man says, well, I don't have a room here, but uh, I have uh, my stable out here or my barn or whatever that was with the animals, but you, that's all I have. You're welcome to spend the night there. And Jesus comes forth in perfect condition. Imagine this. You're talking about treasuring something in your heart. When she picked him up and held her, Here's what had to come to her mind. I'm holding the Son of God. Not the Son of Joseph, but the Son of God. 
And I had nothing to do with this except to bear him. And Joseph had nothing to do with him but to help deliver him. The awesome moments of the birth of Jesus, a treasure in their hearts they would never forget as long as they lived. So when I think about all the things that she thought about, I want you to think about some things that she had to consider, some ideas, some thoughts she had, and especially as a mother. Thinking about what she thought, she gave birth to the Son of God. This was not just another baby. That from her womb came the Son of God. The Son of God, that is, God who took upon himself human flesh like any other child except sinless, and was born like any other child, the Son of God. Not the Son of Joseph, not the Son of Mary, but the Son of God. And she had to be thinking about this. You know, normally I would think this is my Son. This is the Son of God. So she had to ponder that in her heart. A second thing was this. Think about this. Her Son would be her Savior. What a thought. Her Son would be her Savior. Because the more she listened to him probably and talked to him, the more she began to understand his mission in life. How much he told her, we do not know. But certainly he had to have told her many things to maybe prepare her for what was ahead. Maybe he kept a lot of the painful part out. A third thing was this. She had to think about this. She had to exchange her parental authority for his divine authority. That is, she had to give up her parental authority. He was God, and now his divine authority was what ruled in that household and what ruled in his life and in her life. He had to be in submission to her all the years of his life that he was with her for this reason. Think about it carefully. Why did he come? He came for the purpose of giving his life as a sacrificial offering to the Father and atonement. His death was a sacrificial death, a substitutionary death. He died in the place of all sinners, took upon him the sin debt of all mankind, laid down his life at the cross in order to become our Savior. Now watch this. In becoming our Savior, watch this carefully, He took our guilt and our sin and gave us His righteousness. That was the exchange. He took upon Himself our sin. Now, the only way He could do that is to be a perfect son, a perfect child, a perfect man. That is because, you see, He had to keep the law absolutely and perfectly. That meant He had to be in subjection uh, to His parents all the days of his life until the time came for him to walk away. That is, in subjection as far as the way he treated them and so forth, but he had the authority of divinity. He had the authority of God, but in doing so, he still, as long as he was that son there, he had to be absolutely obedient because if he had sinned, he could not be the sacrifice. And the last thing I would say is this. She gave him physical life, and he gave her eternal life. What a thought. When I think about that, she gave him physical life. He gave her eternal life. The things that she treasured in her heart are hard to conceive. So when I think about all of that, I think about this. Who in your life is a treasure to you? What kind of relationship do you have with anyone that you could say, she is a treasure in my life? He is a treasure in my life. Is it your husband? I hope so. Is it your wife? I hope so. Is it your children? Is it your grandchildren? Is it your grandparents? Is it your parents? That is, who in your life is a treasure because of who they have been to you, because of what they've done for you, 
because of who and what kind of life they have lived before you. Who is a treasure to you? Is there anything else in your life you treasure? Do you own something you treasure? Do you treasure something that you had to work very, very hard for? You labored for it diligently, and you treasure it? That is, it's very valuable to you. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as, as long as the things we treasure don't get ahead of God. Well, let me ask you this. What about, is there any promise? Is there any promise that you treasure? Let me tell you the promise in the Word of God that I treasure above all the other verses in the Bible. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. Do you have a treasure verse? A verse that you treasure, that just sort of rises above all the rest of them and that you, that you just love it, you hold it close, you're grateful for it, <laughs> you wouldn't want to give it up for anything in the world. You have, you, you have any of those verses? But let me ask you this. How many precious moments in prayer do you have to treasure? When I think about that, I think about times that have no equal, moments, usually moments and minutes that have no equal when it comes to experiences in life, of times with the Lord when He makes His voice so crystal clear and His instructions so very, very clear to understand. Moments that you cannot describe, moments you cannot give away, and moments you cannot duplicate because every one of them is brand new. What about those moments? Oh, you have moments in loving someone, moments in playing your children. What about moments with God? How many of those do you have etched in your mind? How many of those do you ponder? How many of those do you bring back when you're going through some difficulty, hardship, or pain? We should build into our life those awesome treasures. Now you say, but what about the bad times? Are they treasures? Let me tell you how bad times become treasures. Because every pain, heartache, difficulty, trial, hardship, failure, whatever, doesn't make any difference what it is. You and I know that as His children, God allowed it. It may have been something that we would never want to repeat again. Maybe it's something that was our fault or something somebody else's fault. Painful, difficult, hard. You say, well, how, how does that become a treasure? Here's the way it becomes a treasure. Because you realize that you have become more valuable to God in His kingdom as a result of what you've been through, your heartaches and your trials and your sorrows and your tears and your losses and your wins. He takes even the tough things. They can become treasures to us if we will respond correctly and recognize that even bitter things are sometimes the gift of God because He loves us enough not to let us just go along in life with things that are easy and understandable. So what are the treasures in your life? So I want to make a suggestion to you. Before you go to bed this very day, tonight maybe you get yourself a piece of paper or a card and a pencil. You write at the top of the sheet, I treasure the following in my life. Now, would you not put at the top, what I treasure most is my personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. First and foremost, and then let all those other things follow that. If you can do that, He will help you understand some things you should treasure. And it may be that as you think about them, 
you may want to call somebody and say, I just want to tell you how much I love you. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. I want to thank you for what you've done for me. I want to thank you for understanding me. Thank you for forgiving me. It just may be that God will use this time as you look at the things you treasure to encourage somebody else who needs to realize they too have things to treasure. And Father, how grateful we are. You treasure us. And we know that. You don't treasure us because we're worthy or because of any good things we've done. You treasure us because we're yours. And Lord, if we didn't know any other way to prove it, we could just take one glance at the cross and realize that is a symbol of the Father's treasure as he sees us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world in the humble form of a baby, going all the way to the cross to give us eternal life. And we praise you in Jesus' name, your precious name. Amen. If you've been blessed by today's program, please visit us at intouch.org. In Touch, leading people worldwide into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and strengthening the local church. This program is sponsored by In Touch Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.